welcome to IIEA Insights with me, Dan O'Brien. And an especially warm welcome to our guest today, best-selling author and leading analyst of geopolitics, Robert D. Kaplan. Robert, you're very welcome. One of the perks of working for a think tank is the opportunity to talk to thinkers you've learned a lot from. I've learned a great deal from Robert's writings over the years, but his latest book is exceptional even by his standards. Not least because in it is distilled a half century of experience of its topic. The book, titled The Loom of Time Between Empire and Anarchy from the Mediterranean to China, is worth the price for any number of individual chapters alone, most of which cover the countries of that geography with a mix of historically informed analysis, journalistic interviews with dozens of people, and the observations of a seasoned travel writer. So without further ado, again, Robert, you're really welcome. The book was uh, one of the best things I've read on the region in many years. Um, I thought I might start with one of the more optimistic uh, uh, countries you analyze in the region, and that's Iran. Um, you, you, you feel that it's, it's on the brink of another revolution. You get a feeling that the country, something akin to Poland in the 1980s. And you also write that you believe given the sophistication of Persian society and, and politics, that it, it could be possible for regime change in Iran to happen quite smoothly without uh, a breakdown in order or, 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 or the sort of anarchy that you discuss so much in the book. If that were to happen, what sort of regimes do you think could possibly replace the existing uh, one in Tehran? Well, thank you, Dan. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm relatively optimistic in the book on Iran in the middle and longer terms. I think the great change in the Middle East will occur, not necessarily if Israel were to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia or something like that. It would be it would be it would be an internal change in Iran that would change the entire region. Think of Iran as a government of North Koreans that happens to be ruling a country of South Koreans. It has a very, very narrow base of support. It's hated throughout the country. One thing you have not seen in recent weeks and months since October 7th, you have not seen big, massive demonstrations in Iran for the Palestinians because the regime could not get those people together. There's no public support generally beyond the regime and its cohorts for the Palestinians. That's how hated the regime is. Um, in Iran. Now, change, uh, you know, a change can be tumultuous. It could be violent. It can occur because of massive demonstrations. It could occur, as we've seen in 2009, 17, 18, 19, and most recently in late 2022 in Tehran and other major cities. Uh, the regime, I like to say, is in a kind of Brezhnev phase before the end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, um, it's you know, it's a tired revolutionary regime that has destroyed the middle class that is hated. And that meanwhile, you have 85 million highly educated, urbanized Iranians waiting to poise to join the global economy. Um, and that would be the big change in globalization. So what I'm saying is use your imagination in this book. That's what I'm writing. You know, use your imagination. Don't assume automatically that the current regime in Iran is here forever, because it's not. And there will be a change, and it depends when it happens and how it happens. It could initially get worse through a Revolutionary Guard Corps regime that replaces the mullahs, or it may not. I don't know, but the you know um, the regime in Iran is not the end of history in Iran. There will be other regimes there with very different foreign policies and, uh, and outlooks on the world. And in terms of those outlooks, I think it's fair to say that many of uh, Iran's neighbors would say they have strained at the very least uh, relations with, uh, with Tehran. You mentioned in the discussion of Turkey about 20 years ago that, that, that Erdogan's view of, of, the, of his relations with other countries at the time was have no enemies. Is it possible that you could get an Iranian regime that ceases to have better relations with all its neighbors or at least not have bad relations and that that would, you know, across the, the Gulf, 
strains across the Gulf, obviously a, a relation, the, the situation between Iran and Israel, um, in Lebanon. W w is, is it possible that that would be transformative for the region and bring a much yeah, more stable region? Yeah, I think region? it could be. I think it could be. You don't need a pro-Western regime in Tehran. You just need a, 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 a neutral, moderate regime in Iran that wants to normalize relations with the Arab Gulf countries uh, beyond just exchanging ambassadors. I mean, a true normalization with the Gulf countries in Saudi Arabia that would take a less aggressive stance in Iraq. Because remember, one of the reasons Iraq has been so unstable since the U.S. invasion is because of the meddling of Iran. And if that meddling stopped, who knows, you know, we could see a dramatic improvement in the internal relations with Iran, uh, with Iraq, rather. Um, and also a normal regime in Iran. Remember, I'm saying not necessarily pro-Western, but just normal would uh, would probably even normalize relations with Israel. I know that sounds wild and crazy. Um, at the moment. But if you think through these things, if you think through the fact that the population as a whole is not pro-Palestinian in Iran at all, because they're so hateful of their own regime, um, you know, it, 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 for, it causes them to be against anything that the regime is for, essentially. So, I, you know, as I said, I think that will be the big tra transformative event in the region of the greater Middle East, not, um, not, not normalization between Israel and the Arab states, because in a sense, that's already happened, although it's been in abeyance somewhat since October 7th. What, what, one issue when you say that the, the, the people, the population, uh, anything the regime is in favor of, the, the people maybe not so much in favor of. The one thing that occurs to me that could be an exception to that is the acquisition of nuclear weapons. I've never met an Iranian who wasn't um, more like maybe the Indians and the Pakistanis about that nuclear weapons would be a sign of, of, of strength um, of all kinds of, of, of people uh, from Iran. Is that, you know the country a lot better than I do, um, is, is that a, a concern that a future, any future uh, Iranian regime will still seek uh, nuclear um, I, I think any regime in Iran will feel that it is it is in Iran's right as a great country with a great imperial tradition to have nuclear power. Um, so, like uh, you know, uh, you know, in Iran with nuclear with you know with nuclear um, uh, uh, you know nuclear power plants, any regime in Tehran will support that. But that does not necessarily mean that a new regime in Iran would be in favor of weaponizing. Um, uh, uh, you know, it could easily move away from that while retaining its nuclear program. And remember, the real problem that the West, the Arab states, and Israel have against Iran's nuclear program is the nature of the regime itself that they don't trust that regime with that technology. But if the regime itself were to change its character, the whole, you know, the, uh, you know, the whole issue would be reevaluated re and re-scrambled. You know, you can easily foresee a normalized Iranian regime with nuclear power plants that does not weaponize and which is accepted by the region. Okay, that's uh, uh, interesting. One thing you, you mentioned a few minutes ago was the just exchange of ambassadors between uh, Saudi and, and Iran, and you you sort of seem to dismiss that as not being that significant. That 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 agreement was brokered, if I recall, by China. Do do you think that involvement of China was significant? Yeah, well, I write a lot about China in the book, The Loom of Time. The book starts with China in the Middle East. You know, it ends with China in the Middle East, sort of. It's, you know, you know, China is very, very active in the Middle East in ways that are, that are beyond the headlines. It's not just the biggest consumer of both Iranian and Saudi oil and natural gas, 
but it's also involved in big development projects in the tens of billions of dollars in Egypt, around the Suez Canal zone. It's got a military base in Djibouti at the mouth of the Red Sea. It has military ambitions in the Middle East. Um, the Middle East is crucial for Iran's Belt and Road Initiative. So the Chinese are more for China's Belt and Road Initiative. So China is really ambitious in um is really ambitious in the middle east it um uh, in terms of the exchange of ambassadors look most countries have diplomatic relations with most other countries you know uh, you know and you know exchanging ambassadors is a good thing but it doesn't really normalize relations in this case so to speak i mean the fact that china was able to broker a deal in you know uh, projects chinese power more in the region but the Saudis are still have to lean on the United States for security support. That has not changed. The Saudis are still very suspicious of Iran. Remember, um, you know, Iran was a country that bombed Saudi oil facilities, um, you know, is supporting the Houthis in Yemen against the Saudis. Um, so there's a long way to go in terms of true normalization of relations between Riyadh and Tehran. And you, you don't see, do you think it would take regime change in, in Tehran to have some sort of truly normal relationship across the Gulf? Yes. Um, see, I know we're in a very, very negative, difficult period in the Middle East right now as we speak. But I think the longer and middle term future of the Middle East could be quite peaceful. Um, you know, in the sense, when you look forward to um, the destruction of Hamas, to Saudi is Israeli normalization, to um, you know, to you know, to some sort of change in the politics in Tehran over the next five or ten years, you could be looking at a much more different area, and that's why the theme of my book is not about Israel and the Palestinians, which isn't in the book at all, practically. But it's about the struggle of regimes, Egypt, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, others, to reach this middle point between tyranny on one extreme and anarchy on the other extreme, to reach some sort of middle road. It may be democratic, usually not, but that's really not the main issue. The issue is not authoritarianism versus democracy. The issue is reaching this middle point between tyranny and anarchy in the region, because most people in the region, don't. their goals are dignity and stability and peace, not necessarily having the right to vote once every four years. I think that comes out very, very clearly in your chapter on, on Saudi Arabia, which we, we might get to if we have time. But as you mentioned, you didn't have a chapter. Your, your, your book focuses on the bigger, most populist country, a populist uh, countries in the region. Uh, so you didn't have a, a chapter in Israel, Palestine, but clearly October the 7th has happened since you wrote the book and since it was published. Just a, a thought on that sort of hope for, for a more peaceful future. What sort of end game can you envisage um, in Israel, Palestine, in, in this war between Israel and Hamas? It's, it's, it's very difficult to see even the outlines of a, of, of a, a peaceful, stable, peaceful, longer term solution at this point, surely. Well, a possible end game is that if Hamas is not able to reconstitute itself in the Gaza Strip, that um, there are there is a kind of a layer of Palestinians uh, who reside in in Qatar, who reside in Dubai, uh, former you know people like Mohammed Dalan and others, uh, Marwan Barghouti, who's in prison in Israel, but could be a future leader of Palestine. Um, um, people who are not, you know, who who can work, who, you know, who are independent, who want an independent Palestinian state but, are, state, but are not averse to cooperating with the Israeli security services for, you know, for the sake of law and order and other. And then you add that to massive amounts of aid to rebuild Gaza from the Saudis, uh, to more cooperation from the Egyptians, 
um, you might necessarily get a stable system, you know, a stable kind of regime. I think some things have to be realized. Um, one is that, um, you know, when we talk about a, an independent Palestinian state and the end of Israeli occupation, Israel has not occupied the Palestinian, uh, occupied the Gaza Strip for uh for for almost 20 years it left in 2005 all the military units of of Israel left Gaza in 2005 in 2005 9000 israeli settlers were ejected from the gaza strip they were ejected forcibly by israel's own forces so in a de facto sense gaza has been independent since 2005 now can you imagine what someone like lee kuan yew could have done with the gaza strip in 20 years um you know he would have turned it into a tourist paradise, into a place to do business with a lovely, long Mediterranean coast, perfect ties to countries throughout the region, geographic, geo, geographically blessed um, in a way, yes, with a water shortage, but with peaceful relations with neighboring countries, he could have imported water. The, the, um, the Gazans opted for something else. They opted for a permanent, you know, war state, um, you know, to continue fighting Israel. And that has made all the difference. So in Israeli minds, it's not a question of uh, uh, ending occupation. They already did that in Gaza in 2005. Um, so I think my point is that so far, this war may have driven Israeli voters further to the right. You know, when they see what has happened in the in the Gaza Strip, they say, if we allow, if we pull all settlers and troops out of the West Bank, is that going to become another Gaza? Um, uh, you know, in other words, so it's moved is the Israeli voting population to the right at the same time that Netanyahu is himself very unpopular. So it kind of scrambles things. It's hard to know which way things will move uh, in, a, in, an elect, in, a, in a coalition sense inside the Israeli government. There are different forces at work, but it's not simply a question of ending occupation because that happened in 05 in Gaza. Uh, I might come back to Egypt if we could, but just in terms of the regional implications of, of what's happened since since uh, October 7th. Um, yeah, I would sort of just as background and note that oil prices are lower today than they were, you know, the day before the, the attacks. And no Arab country that has relations with, with Israel has, has severed them. Is that in any way to suggest that uh, appalling as the events uh, that are taking place are um, for, for innocent people, uh, that the regional implications haven't been as big or we could look to the Red Sea, See the interruption of of, um, of of shipping through the uh, through through the Suez uh, Canal and also to some extent Le Lebanon. What, what what's your take on the direction of the regional implications since October seven? Look, we're in a very fragile state. We can easily see an, a regional explosion, a war erupt tomorrow and it's between Israel and southern Lebanon and Hezbollah, things like that. However. Given the extent and the ferocity of, of the fighting since early October in the Gaza Strip, you know, it's October, November, this Jan we've had five months. We're going on half a year of, of total war in the Gaza Strip. The re it, what's interesting, as you suggest, uh, Dan, is what has not happened. Not what has happened, but what has not happened. Is Egypt still has an ambassador in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, wherever he is. The Saudis are still on track for eventually normalizing relations with Israel. The Gulf Arab states have still have relations with Israel. Um, there, you know, there's been no massive pro-Palestinian demonstrations in Iran. Um, you know, and there hasn't been an, an explosion in southern Lebanon. You know, there's been a lot of tit for tat, you know, sending of missiles, but no real outright war. So I think things could be much worse than they are, really. And if we can get a ceasefire, even lasting a few weeks, that's going to really reduce the pressure on the Egyptian leadership 
on, uh, you know, in some ways um, on, on the Saudis versus their own population and others. So um, it could be a lot worse. And while you mentioned, mentioned Egypt, it, it does has to strike one that the that the lack of any sort of humanitarian um, assistance uh, is striking. Now, you know, you caught in the book in your chapter on, on Egypt just how atrophied a country it is and how it hasn't hasn't developed um, in the way of some other some other countries in the region. Um, and since your book, of course, it's, uh, Egypt is going to the IMF and things are pretty disastrous economically. Um, do, do you think what constrains Egypt is 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 that lack of capacity, lack basic lack of money, or is other deeper security reasons, which clearly this is both? But uh, it's deep reasons. You know, I spent a lot of time in Egypt, interviewed dozens of people. You know, there's a big chapter in the book about Egypt. Egypt has has been has had a succession of what I call in the book Nasserite pharaohs, you know, starting with Nasser himself, really continuing with Sadat, with Mubarak, you know, then two years of a democratic experiment that went badly and and ending with Al Sisi. You know, these are all these are all military leaders who believed. And this is the key thing that the military has control over the economy. Uh, you know, Egypt is a state still, as it was in going back to the 50s, where the military runs the economy per se, you know, de facto. And, and in a modern globalized era of the 21st century, where you need flat layers, where you need, you know, you, you, you know of just lots of entrepreneurship, um, you know, of, of flat hierarchies, you have a top heavy, vertical, overly bureaucratized Egyptian military running the economy. And that is the key issue that has prevented development, that's prevented Egypt from becoming like Malaysia or Vietnam or some state or some highly dynamic economies in Southeast Asia, um, essentially. You know, and this is so Egypt just lumbers on, you know, without, you know, without any progress because it's a military run state. And um, and and until that changes or begins to shift, maybe because, as I speculate in the book, over breaks in the ranks themselves, you know, different elements of the military start debating with each other. Um, until that, until the, the 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 Egyptian military lets its lets go of its stranglehold on the Egyptian economy, it, Egypt is going to always be in a perilous state. And a, a, a nice segue to, to Saudi. Clearly, the role of the military is much different in Saudi and doesn't have that stultifying control over the economy. Writing about uh, Saudi, you, you mentioned that Saudis today are 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 both that Saudi Arabia is both more are, more aristocratic and freer um, at the same time. Um, yes. I thought that was a really interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, certainly, yeah. from my travels to, to both Egypt and Saudi, the, the difference is, is, is very stark just in terms of the sense of momentum and, and modernization. And you you, you stress Mohammed bin Sal Sal Salman's uh, role as, as a reformer in Saudi, not necessarily, as you say, uh, being any less autocratic than other leaders, leaders in, in Saudi, but also being a major reformer. Maybe that's a, 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 a point just teasing out a bit for those who haven't read the book. Yes. Um, look, as one Saudi told me, he said, we've had the same regime, the same family governing us for over 100 years. All our changes of government due to death of the leaders have been peaceful. Uh, you know, King Faisal was assassinated in 1975, but within 48 hours, there was a new king and everything went on smoothly. Um, you know, as again, so he so, said, and, and we provide our people with technocratic, moderate, conservative, you know, you know, you know, administration 
Um, you know, there's peace. The government is fairly is fairly becoming more and more competent, especially in a digital age. Uh, we want no part of your Arab Spring or democracy experiments. You know, this was the, uh, this was the message that I got. Mohammed bin Salman, NBS, as he is called, is on the one hand, as I say, more autocratic because he's a wreck. He's changed it from kind of a lazy tyranny to a very modern autocratic dictatorship, you know, where um, where challenges to the regime are brutally suppressed um, and also at the same time made it more open by um, allowing women really dramatically greater freedoms by integrating women really dramatically into the workforce. Um, by allowing music and all sorts of cultural events that were never permitted before. So it's basically a regime dedicated to impressing young Saudis who want to be part of the global world. You know, you know the, the regime is basically telling young Saudis, look, we know what you want. We'll give it to you. But, but, and we only ask one thing. Don't challenge the regime. Don't challenge who's in power, essentially. That's the trade-off. That's the, uh, the social contract in Saudi Arabia. Um, in, for instance, COVID. I was in Saudi Arabia during COVID. They handled it very efficiently. Everyone got an app on their iPhone or whatever mobile device they had showing that they had been vaccinated. They had to show the app every time they entered a, a supermarket or a movie theater or someplace where people gathered. It was all very seamless and efficient, um, much more so, I would say, than in the United States at the time where I live. Very interesting, interesting point. And in terms of Saudi being a, a destabilizing factor, exporting extremism as, as happened in the past, is that is that something very much in the past now? Um, I think, um, as it was explained to me several times, um, the Saudis are committed to eventually integrating Israel into the Middle East. Now, that has gone quiet since October 7th and the aftermath of October 7th and the war in Gaza. But that's still part of the Saudi grand strategy, I think. Remember, the Saudis were never revolutionary in the Middle East. They were always very conservative. Um, even in the times where they had where they refused to even talk to anyone from Israel or anything like that, they were still essentially Western. They, uh, in, in, they were pro-Western. They were fiercely anti-Soviet throughout the Cold War. Um, um, yeah, the Saudis were always able to operate in favor of the United States, but often from behind the scenes, because the greatest, you know, the greatest fear the Saudi leadership had was not of Israel, but of their own people. You know, because their own people have traditionally been far more conservative um, than the regime itself. It was the regime that brought women's education into the into the hinterlands uh, of the country, even though it was opposed by by local conservative mullahs. You know, the regime has always been a progressive force in Saudi Arabia. That's very hard for Westerners to grasp because in the West, because in the West, the government is usually the bad guy, and it's all these progressive forces on outside from the outside who pressure the government. But in Saudi Arabia, historically, it's been the reverse. It's always been the government that has, that has brought change and reform, not the population. And that, maybe we can go to the final country that you, you cover so well, uh, one closest to home for us here in Europe, Turkey. Um, I, again, you know, transformation, unlike Egypt, uh, a transformation in Turkey over the past 20, 30 years economically, um, politics has gone on in a different direction. Um, how, one of the points you made in, in the book was that European Union not bringing uh, Turkey in with its first big wave of enlargement 20 years ago, that that really was a huge turning point, that that turned Turkey away. And had Turkey joined, things would have been better for both Europe and Turkey. I wonder, would you 
is it not possible that the European Union would have imported a, a, a bigger Orban uh, with Erdogan? Um, uh, and that would have been absolutely more destabilizing for the European Union and not help, helped. Um, it's possible. But if you look at Erdogan himself, he's very, very... Um, He's very, very calculating and really seems to believe in nothing except stabilize, except staying in power and, and, and strengthening his own rule. His decisions in the Middle East, backing radical Arab forces, not backing moderate Arab regimes, was always very populist. He's, you know, he's been like a Muslim populist because that's the way to that's been the way to win elections and remain in power. I think had the European Union allowed Turkey in, this is going back 25 years or so, we either might not have had an Erdogan in the first place, or we would have had an Erdogan who remained moderate. Because remember, when he was elected, he was elected as a Muslim moderate, as a Muslim Democrat, as a reformer in the Western sense. You know, in you know the way you know Erdogan was popular in the West the first few years of his rule. Um, uh, you know, he started to drift away from the West. Towards um, towards a radical posture as it became clear that Turkey had no chance of getting into the European Union, you know, so I can't say what would have happened, but you know, but Erdogan's radicalism, his populist radicalism, has evolved against the context of a Turkey that has had no option of getting into the European Union. And just a final one on, on Turkey's role sort of regionally. You mentioned in the in the book 20 years ago that, that the stance of Turkey was have no enemies in the region. Now you you again highlighted military involvement, Turkey's military involvement involvement in Syria, Libya, Qatar, um uh, Somalia. Um does that signify a more I mean you also highlight the point that, that, that unlike in the West. Um, in Turkey, the imperial past, the Ottoman past, is something a source of pride and, and uh, not something of a source of shame. Um, does that signify that there is both a, a popular demand and a demand by the uh, Erdogan to to become more militarily assertive? Well, remember, in Turkey, imperialism is not a dirty word. In the West, imperialism is a dirty word. Turks are proud of their empire, just like Iranians are proud of their empire, just as the Chinese are proud of theirs, and on and on it goes. It's only in the West where imperialism has the, you know... Um, has this stigma. But the average Turk, even liberal Turk, is proud of the Ottoman past, is proud of an empire that governed from Algeria to Iraq, you know, essentially for 400 years. Uh, it's the nature of that, uh, of, you know, of that pride where there are differences, um, uh, you know, the, where, where there are real differences. Because you know, Erdogan sees the Tur sees the Ottoman past as um as something to something to replicate whereas turkish liberals just see it as a way uh you know as something is something in something to, to enhance national pride and to integrate themselves better in the region um can i just thank you again um uh, as i say i can uh, heartily recommend uh, the book it really is a fantastic uh, fantastic read um, thanks so much for giving us your time today, and um, uh, it was hugely appreciated. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for me.